Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Museums and Archives for the Public Historian. First we'll talk about museums, and then we'll talk about archives. Let's begin by defining what museums are. According to the International Council of Museums in 2007, a museum, quote, is a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society and its development, open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. The most common types of museums with which you're probably familiar, though there are many other types of museums, are art museums and history museums. Let's take a second and distinguish between these. Art museums display pieces of art, whether they're graphic arts, paintings, prints, things like that, 3D art, um, some new types of digital art, um, principally for the enjoyment of the art and the education of artists and people interested in those fine arts. A history museum is a little bit different niche. It uh, has a slightly broader public. It is usually for the purpose of inter, uh, excuse me, for educating as well as entertaining and informing its public. And the most important component of a history museum is that in displaying the artifacts or reconstructions that it does display, it attempts to put those pieces of information into the context of their times. The mission, then, of a history museum is to collect, preserve, and educate. And really, this is a 20th century mission. Professional museums are scholarship-based institutions of learning that weave historical scholarship, object analysis, and contemporary issues together to create stimulating experiences for the visitor. This is according to Mark Howell in his essay, Interpreters and Museum Educators Beyond the Blue Hairs in Public History, Essays from the Field. Now, this education goes beyond data about the objects as objects. But it must address the historical importance that such, such objects denote. That is, it offers interpretation and meaning, and it engages the audience in this interpretation, meaning, and placing in context. Let's look at a short history of museums. Museums existed in antiquity, but they were either private collections or uh, advanced studies institutes like the Museum Library of Alexandria, which burned in the 3rd century of the Common Era. In the Renaissance, we see our first modern museums. They're still the private playthings of the rich, but they introduced something that had long legs into the future after the Renaissance, and that is the gallery, which we normally associate with an art museum, and the so-called cabinet. The first is a side-lighted hall, usually for displaying art, and the second is a closed room for displaying artifacts. By the time of the so-called early national period in the United States, say approximately 1800 through about 1830, or a little earlier, then the cabinet became the privately held cabinet of curiosities, usually meant to display the erudition of the owner, often allowing the owner to create a canon of knowledge around the artifacts and to determine what lessons the viewer took from them. That is, the cabinet was the museum as a temple, a temple to receive wisdom in, and it denoted the power, that is, the erudition and the authority of the owner. The owner may or may not have been correct, 
about what was going on with the artifacts, but the situation was such that the viewer, who was often an invited person rather than a member of the public, then accepted the authority of the owner of the stuff, and this received wisdom is much like a bad analogy, but, but go with me on this, a priest who is dispensing wisdom in the Sanctum Sanctorum. P.T. Barnum challenged this idea. Now, we remember P.T. Barnum uh, from the circus, but he began with a museum, and you can see Bar uh, an ad here for Barnum's American Museum. For Barnum, the museum was a sprawling cabinet of curiosities, everything displayed equally. No one was there to interpret or offer authority um, or put into context, and things didn't have a particular order in the display. They were just put in incongruously things side by side, mostly for the entertainment value. This, however, was a forum. That is, an exchange of ideas that was rowdy, egalitarian, challenging intellectually. It allowed people to engage the artifacts without guidance or even educational labels. They made up their own ideas as they went along. This may or may not be intellectually sound, but it is the kind of thing that the public historian runs into all the time. There is in the forum an egalitarian aspect. Sometimes that egalitarian aspect is a meeting of similarly educated minds. Frequently, however, it is a meeting of similarly equal political power. Museum curation and museum direction professionalized, which is a mid to late 20th century uh, phenomenon, and it means that museum curation became a teachable set of skills and ideas with a literature that for the most part became closed off to people who did not go through the training exercises and now go through college in order to be educated in these relatively arcane knowledge of the museum curator. That is, the museum curators, like many other professionals in the 20th century, have figured out a way to get paid for what they do. And it's a way to, to commercialize not the knowledge economy. This isn't a slam at museum curators, because professors have done the same thing, social workers, librarians, archivists, public historians are learning how to use professionalization to create an industry for which they can get paid for doing the work. Let's look now at archives and define the archives in the three ways that archivists use the word archives. One use of the word archives means the body of records. A person will produce a body of records and historical manuscripts, and we call that that person's archives. Um, a, a business or some kind of nonprofit entity like a church or a charity will develop a set of records over time, the detritus of the things that they have done, and that becomes their archives. But it also means a repository, a physical place that gathers in all of the records, either of the uh, institution that it serves or of the community that it serves. Finally, the archives is the agency that operates the repository. So among archivists, how that word is defined, the word archives, comes specifically from the context in which it is used. And in fact, learning those three definitions and which means what, when, is part of the arcane knowledge that archivists pass along in order to 
mark themselves off from the rest of society? What is the mission of any archives but to identify, preserve, and make available records of enduring value? There are, in the community of archivists in the United States, two competing traditions. Now, unless you are a practicing archivist, you probably won't notice these two competing traditions, but these are the things that the archival community goes at each other hammer and tongs about. One is the historic manuscript collecting tradition. It is the older tradition and still dominates to a good extent of archival traditions. This is the notion that a repository and an agency collect the historic documents and papers of individuals and organizations. The other is the public records tradition. This is the idea that the archives is a repository for a, a public entity like a government's records. And the way that those records are valued and the way that they are uh, handled for research and the people they serve tend to be different than the historic manuscript collecting tradition. That is, the historic manuscript collecting tradition tends to want researchers to come in to use the records for their evidential and um, informational value, whereas the public records tradition holds that archives collect records regardless of whether they're used in order to document the functions of the government that they serve. And administrative use plays a bigger uh, role in why and how the public records uh, archives deal with their uh, uh, archives, their bodies of records. It's different than a historic manuscript um, uh, repository. This is a little confusing, I understand, but I wanted you to know about these. Again, you probably won't really see this in action unless you pursue a career in archives. Let's look at some of the history of archives and say that you can take an entire course on the history of archives at Troy University. That will be HIS 3360. But we'll just give you one slide's worth here. Archives are ancient. We see archives in Babylonia, in Egypt, in Greece, and in Rome. The Babylonian archives are, of course, those repositories of the so-called clay tablets that were written in cuneiform. In fact, these tablets are about the size of the palm of your hand or your hand and fingers. Um, a wedged stylus was used to press into the, um, into the wet clay tablet the language of the Babylonians and, and even earlier, then these were wrapped in a sheet of clay that was also inscribed with exactly the same message. The archives existed, these were all business documents, the archives existed as a central governmental repository of these business documents so that if there was ever a dispute about the business at hand, then the court could find that particular document and read it and see what the contract actually was. The reason we have so many of these is because the structures in which they were housed were often wooden, and when they burned, they quite literally baked these clay documents. And so they preserved them quite well. Uh, the Egyptian archives, uh, written on papyrus, uh, scrolled. Also, you might see, um, uh, you, can, you can consider uh, hieroglyphics to be a form of archives. Uh, we see the same thing in Greece. In fact, one of the most famous Greek archives uh, was a, a small body of records about military procurement um, 
created on sheets of soft lead and found at the bottom of a well. And of course, the Romans had extensive archives, both in Rome and throughout the uh, provinces, in order to document the business of governing an empire. In medieval Europe, we see that, uh, you know, we get this idea that the king lived in a castle in medieval Europe. Well, really, the king, the king's castle may not have been that big a deal. And the king was frequently either a noble who could be controlled by other nobles or a noble that had great respect from the other nobles. And frequently that king, in order to keep the local nobles from trying to become kings in their own right, traveled and lived with local nobles the entire year around. And so these traveling kings carried traveling archives of scrolls of parchment generally with them called the Treasure de Chartres. This is relatively unimportant for you, but it is literally a treasure chest with scrolls or charts in, in it of important documents, uh, usually of what the uh, vassal had agreed to owe to the king. As literacy developed, repositories were needed, um, and governmental or governments departmentalized and generated many, many records, particularly after the development in the Renaissance and post-Renaissance, early modern era of um, uh, nation states and centralized governments. The modern archives, as we understand it today, began with the French Revolution. The records of government, according to the French revolutionaries, belonged to the people because the people were the government. The French made many mistakes about arranging their records until in the 1830s they developed a concept that they called the FONDS, F-O-N-D-S. We in the archives community now call that the principle of provenance. That is a fairly simple archives arrangement concept that materials are organized according to who created the material, not according to their subject matter. Let me give you a quick instance that you will understand because you deal with it fairly frequently. In a library, The books are arranged by subject order. Dewey Decimal, for example, is a subject-based numerical system. Library of Congress subject headings and the the, uh, numbers that Library of Congress uses, all based on subject arrangement. All of the books on Alabama are together. All of the books on uh, World War II are together. All of the books on economic history are together, regardless of who wrote them. In an archives, if an author wrote a work on Alabama, a work on economic history, and a work on World War II, then you would find that author's records, regardless of what book he or she was working on, would be in a single collection. This really goes back to a problem that the French had when they took records from each of the states called départements, and instead of keeping the records together by the state name, they divvied the records up according to a, an arbitrary subject classification system that was not well thought out. For example, um, regardless of who created the records, what department created the records, if it had to do with waterways, it went over to the waterways um, subject area. D- you know, like librarians have always done. Um, And this just proved after the 1830s to be completely unwieldy. No one could find what they were looking for anymore. And so the French developed this concept of uh, provenance or respect du fond. A little bit later, the Prussian government, which is the government for all intents and purposes um, of eastern Germany. Uh, Berlin was the capital of Prussia. And everything that you think of about the 19th century German military, those ramrod straight 
slender officers with gray uniforms and a, and a, and a red band around their hat. That's Prussia. That's not Germany. That's Prussia. Um, the monocle concept always comes from Prussia uh, because of dueling traditions in Berlin. That's a whole different story. Nevertheless, the Prussians were extremely well organized uh, to the point of insanity, and they developed a, an archival uh, concept called original order. That is, the archivist doesn't break up the, the filing system in which the documents are maintained because that would violate an intangible notion of how the office worked. Uh, this works pretty well uh, if you're looking at governmental offices, not so much with um, uh, individuals or um, businesses, nonprofits, other organizations that don't have a rigid filing system. Now, in the United States, the first state archives was that of Alabama, founded in 1901. That is the first archives that was developed by a state government to maintain state records and historical documents was that of Alabama in 1901. Mississippi was about six months later in 1902, developing an almost or a very similar uh, repository concept. And the uh, State Archives of Alabama, the State Archives of Mississippi, have since the early 20th century followed a, a very similar track in the way that they have organized their work. After the American Historical Association pushed for almost 40 years, the United States government passed the National Archives Act in 19. Uh, 34 and in 1936, the National Archives, now called the National Archives Regis uh, and, and um, uh, Records Administration, uh, opened in 1936. Let's look now at some of the types of archival repositories in the United States, and this will uh, conclude our lecture. There are federal and state repositories, most of which follow the public records idea of how an archives is supposed to behave. Academic archives have become a large contingency within the archival community since the 1970s and generally perform dual duty. One part of their duty is, is to collect the records of the organization, and since those records are generally subject to open records laws, then the uh, academic repositories, particularly public colleges and universities, then performs a public records function. At the same time, they often collect in the communities, the towns, for example, in which the um, uh, college might uh, reside. They may collect in communities of uh, students. They may collect in communities of faculty and staff. And these records are historic manuscripts. So frequently, you'll see in academic archives that have um, that follow both of these traditions that we identified earlier. We also see corporate archives, that is, archives of businesses, um, and they tend to follow a records management style of uh, archival retention, that is uh, public records, um, but not exactly public. And then we see private archival institutions in the United States. Now, why would I bring these up? Well, to give you an idea of where you can conduct your historical research when the time comes for you to use an archives, but also archives and museums are places where public historians can get jobs if they pursue the right kind of credentialing and the right kind of education. Uh, that is, for example, uh, the State Archives of Alabama requires, even to apply for a job, requires an applicant to have gone through two three-hour 
semester hour courses in archival management of some kind or another. Some academic archives require that same thing. They may even require that the archivist be a certified archivist. Uh, frequently, corporate archives require certification as an archivist or certification as a records manager. And many archivists uh, receive certification in both archives and records management. That's two different professional organizations. Private archives kind of span the spectrum of who they hire to run their archives. This then concludes the lecture, and I thank you very much, as always, for your attention.